Once was a land of woe and strife Where the people were bereft of hope They prayed to their gods of might and light To deliver the heroes of old Instead they got Heroes, did you hear the quotes in my voice of moral ambiguity? They may help or may not help you at all, depends on what's in it for them. They kick and they punch and they maul and they smash, they lie and they scheme and they burn and they slash. Succeed or fail, it has to the tell, dungeons and debacles starts now. Hello and welcome to this episode of the Dungeons and Debacles podcast. I am your host and Dungeon Master Kevin. Going around the table, John. Hello, I play Alunidas, Elvin Monk. And <laughs> Hannah. Hi, I'm Hannah, and I play Talia, the human rope. And Shane. I am Shane, playing Alexander, the human bard. And Blake. I'm Blake, and I'll be playing Juliet, the dragonborn eldritch knight slash wizard. Okay, so the last time on Dungeons & Debacles podcast, uh, you guys had made it out of Mount Sunder, where you ran into a priestess Alolf and uh, a person you had met before Nifron um, who you don't exactly know what his deal is right now other than apparently he's favored by this spider queen you guys had been given instructions and a mission to go find the artifacts and especially the egg to bring uh, ruin access back to this plane um, you made it out of the mountain uh, you journeyed for a while and made camp uh, at some point, um, the dagger woke Alexander up in the night. It compelled him to take somebody's life. Uh, he was able to uh, resist its influence. But in this process, uh, Nifron saw what he was doing, beckoned him to come with him. And uh, they talked a little bit about uh, the need and want to kill. Nifron had brought them to a woodcutter's hut. Uh, where Alexander and Nifron went inside and murdered a family. At that point, the uh, dagger was sated, at least for a while, and said it was going to give uh, Alexander power. They snuck back to the camp that night, uh, woke up the next morning, and began to travel to Ashmarsh. Along the way, um, they ran into two Ettons, that had waylaid some, uh, you think, traders or merchants that were moving salted fish um, from the coast inland. Um, you dispatch those pretty easily, and that's uh, where you find yourselves now. Well, let us continue on our way to Ash Marsh. Yep. You're in travel for probably another half day, and you're going to see the this forest that you're in um, start thinning out. And after a few miles more, it's going to turn into scrubs and uh, a um, field. And probably about 200 yards away, you can see a road um, that is leading in the direction of what you think is uh, Ash Marsh. Even from this distance, you can start to smell water in the air and the decay of some wetlands. And uh, Nifron's going to stop out in front of head of y'all and turn his horse and he's going to say we're about to enter civilization if you have a way to disguise yourselves either mundane or magical I suggest you do that now my current shell is not known so I have no words and then uh, after he says that he's going to make some hand motions and he's going to wipe his uh, forehead across the brow and you're going to notice that the spider-like scar on his forehead has disappeared. And he's going to say, You, however, there's a matter of the bounty. The elf and the man and the girl may perhaps pass without notice. But a dragonborn in this group carrying a halberd and wearing heavy armor. Well, that's worth mentioning. Ah, yes. Well, I will change that right away. And with a wave of her fingers, she transforms into a female elf. Well done. Still heavily armed or no? Uh, yes. And, uh, what did you cast to do that? Disguise self. And how long does that last? One hour. An hour. Okay. 
I will also use Disguise Self, and um, Talia will change into uh, like a teenage boy appearance. No more getting hit on in bars. Yeah, the, she learned from her past experience. I will use Disguise Self as well. Turning into a... Uh, what do I want to turn into? Just stay human, but change my facial features to be more... Uh, more handsome. You can't improve upon perfection. <laughs> What's your charisma? Flattery will get you nowhere. My charisma is 18, I think. Let me check. Yeah, 18. So you're a Justin Bieber type anyway. Well, you see all these... He's making himself rugged. Then. Yeah, I'm getting surgery. Plastic surgery. Temporary plastic surgery. Have you seen that new picture of Justin Bieber running around the internet where he looks like a yeah. guy from Raising Arizona? Looks like he's just getting by on selling and buying meth. Yeah, that's that's a disguised <laughs> self right there. Took that charisma right down to 12. Anywho, uh, is there anybody else wants to do anything? I think I'm unexceptional. I have a cart. So, uh, not everyone's gonna say, that'll probably do. We might even be able to sleep in a bed tonight. But we'll need to hurry into town and get to the inn, because I don't know how long it'll take us to get in and get set up, and their disguises might wear off, and that would be bad. Um, we can just reapply it, I believe. Nifron says we have probably another two, three hours at most before we reach the city. And that might have been premature. Yeah, my, whoop, I thought we were closer. Same. Come now, you all have more magic power than that, right? Right? I guess. But it doesn't make the the spell slot loss any less uh, harmful. Well, if we're all ready, I suppose we can get going. Yep. Gripity quap, motherfuckers. <laughs> So, just to clarify, are we, like, going through a, uh, like, with the two coconuts just clacking along like we're on horses now? Is that our life? Uh, I can add some horses in, but you're on horses at this point. You don't have to walk and, like, make the sound. I'm on a cart with a horse. Neat. So you'll also have to put in creaky wood noises. Uh, I got those. I got all the foley's, you have. You're going to go across this field... And after about 200 yards or so, um, you're going to see this where well-worn path uh, heading west. Um, you get on there, and you're going to travel for about uh, an hour, and you begin to see the outskirts of the city. And along the way, you're going to see people on. Uh, horses uh, maybe every 30 minutes or so with uh, horses and carts um, moving something you know away from the city if you look behind you you'll see in the distance maybe about a mile away you're going to see carts behind you moving toward the city but there's really nothing of uh, any notice uh, it appears to be men and women on carts or wagons uh, moving goods or just moving period to somewhere else that they don't really give you any notice other than maybe you know um, a nod as they're passing you um, along the way you're also going to see farms sporadically um, as you approach the city and then they're going to get um, closer and closer together and you're going to see uh, them growing um, stuff like wheat and corn and potatoes and beans nobody really gives you any uh, notice on your uh, way into the city at this point you are reaching about an hour so if you've got another spell to spin on that uh the sky itself you may want to do it now yep done fresh unnecessary for me all right so you uh cast the spells you reach the town proper and you notice there is no walls here it's a large city, by your estimation, and maybe a couple thousand people live here. Does anybody want to give me a history check? Sure. Sure thing. I'm really good at history. 
I nailed that shit. So that's a crit. So a Lunadoss and uh, even Talia to some extent um, have heard of Ash Marsh before. It's a good sized city that does agricultural trade with many towns and cities across the river. It's a new city, and by new, it's only about 200 years old, um, but it's grown up quite a bit as many of the uh, people who uh, have come to live here are like farm kids and um, people from much smaller towns and villages around the area who have migrated here. Uh, it sprung up from a result of having rich farmland and access to the Black River. The lands around the river are mostly freshwater marsh, and there's a narrowing of the marsh uh, and easier access to the river, and that's why the city sprung up here, because there's a narrow strip of land um, where they can reach the river pretty easily that's not marshy swamp. The city is currently ruled by Govern, uh, Governor uh, Riken Tesh. He's the cousin of the Queen of Asheville. You know, there's no love lost between him and the Queen, as there was some question about the ascendancy of the throne of Asheville. Uh, the nobles uh, supported uh, his sister, Hera Tabald, as she was in their direct line, and she had been raised as a queen. Um, while not outright hostile, Rikon uh, operates almost independently of Asheville, as the city doesn't have much influence outside the land surrounding the capital. They still collect taxes here, but Riken runs Ashmarsh as he wishes, mostly because of the large militia he's contracted. Ashmarsh is low to middle class as a city. Uh, there isn't a lot to the west of the forests of Mount Sunder, and many adults uh, have left their small farms to resettle here and find a better life. Although it's not a huge city, there's work to be had here at the large farms, fisheries, inns, and with merchants that trade goods. Uh, it's a, basically like a smaller fantasy Charleston, South Carolina. I don't know, Charleston does have some culture. Oh, this place does too. Do they have a fantasy spoleto? <laughs> uh, no, they don't. But they do oh, have there you go. They do have a uh, symphony orchestra there. Well, damn. Orchestra. All right, let's head into the city. So if you look on the map, um, where you're going to be entering from is where I am pinging over here to the east of the map. Okay. As you enter the city, on the outskirts are the farms, and then you, as you pass through this road, you are going to see like these jumbles of houses that are tightly packed together in rows. This appears to be the main thoroughfare uh, into the town. The houses here are kind of on the Porsche side, not exactly slums, but you think uh, these are like the um, people that work on the, the farms, um, live on the outskirts of the city, so they have easy access and you know small commutes to, to go work. As you move further in, um, you're going to see a lot of people on the street. You're not aware of any sort of festival or anything going on, like a holiday. But it appears to be a lot of people out on the street this day. And they all appear to be moving towards the center of town. Interesting. Maybe we should see what's happening? Or should we go directly to the Uh, I think we should go ahead and establish a room. Don't want to get caught up in something big, you know? Plus, we can always ask the innkeeper what's going on. Nifron is going to tell you that the district where you would find the inns would be over here in this part of town to the... Uh, Basically, they enter uh, west of town. I would like to suggest going through the side roads to uh, go around to it. Yeah, not go through the center. Yeah, makes sense. What's the harm? Going through the center? And what are they going to do? Yell and scream at us? Or just be crowded and who knows what the hell's going on? They might be trapped there for, or stuck there, I should say, for hours. Like getting stuck in Charlotte traffic after a Panthers game. Or he might get pickpocketed. We would also have a difficult time moving through a crowded street on horses. Especially with cart and tail. Yep. I say just avoid crowds. Unless we have good reason. Oh, and Kevin? Yes. This map is a terrible connect the dots puzzle. <laughs> <laughs> or are you trying to connect all the houses? All the, the numbers. numbers. 
Oh. <laughs> I don't know if you saw it earlier, but I was drawing the lines to connect the dots. But yeah, let's uh, let's go around. Okay, are you moving to the north or the south? The north. Okay, so you will branch off uh, this road um, going to the north. Um, you're going to see much the same on your right. Um, these are poor, how poor houses, but once uh, you start uh, moving up probably about a quarter mile or so, on your left you're going to see um, some more affluent housing. You know, these houses, uh, instead of made of uh, wood, are made of stone, and they have like slate roofing. And some of them are two and three stories tall. Um, you're going to reach a crossroad um, after about another quarter mile. Nifron's going to turn left down this road and motion for you to follow him. And there's not as many people up on the street here as you move west. You see much the same uh, kinds of uh, houses on your left that are more affluent, still on the outside. To the right, you're going to see some poorer houses um, until you come to the next intersection, and um, you're going to see what looks like some middle class housing, and then rising above that, um, maybe five stories, um, you are going to see a temple to your uh, north. To your south, you're going to see another temple that rises about five or six stories, um, about a quarter mile away. And then um, to your south, also, you are going to start seeing um, some inns and music houses and restaurants, some merchants to your south. So Knife Run's going to take you all the way down to this intersection uh, right here. And you're going to be able to see uh, to your west um, what appears to be um, like blacksmithing and stables and livestock for sale and he is going to turn into one of these um, like smaller in houses take his horse in the back where there's stables he's going to get down uh, off of his horse and he's going to go over and he's going to talk to the stable boy and hand him a couple of gold in motion for you to come uh, into the stables done and done going in um, so you take your horses um, and your carts and you guys got rid of those Asheville Knight horses, right? Yes. I honestly have no idea. I think we gave most of them to the uh, Pismo Watsits. Yeah, and Turin uh, took the one of them and I think we only took, uh, what was it, Chimney with us? Yeah, I think that was Adel's horse. Yeah, but I... I I think that's the only extra horse we have. Okay, so you move your horses and your cart in and dismount, and take your saddlebags off, and uh, the stable boy and another boy uh, comes out. They bring your horses into some stalls and start um, brushing them down. And uh, Nifron's going to take his saddlebag and throw it over his shoulders and start walking towards the front of this inn. And uh, as uh, you come up on the inn, this is about a <clears throat> three story inn. It's uh, made of uh, some whitewashed wood um, that's got a black slate roof. Um, it has uh, pretty decent windows on it, so not, while not exactly high class, this uh, looks like a pretty affluent inn. What about the wainscoting? <laughs> Let's talk about the soffits. They're made of bronze. So, um, he is going to uh, open the door for this place and walk in. Linderdass is right behind him. All right, so you go into the inn, and at this point, it is probably 3 o'clock, 4 o'clock in the afternoon, and uh, you would think uh, this would probably be kind of a busy time for people to be getting, like, uh, an early dinner and then back to their houses. Um, but there's not really... A lot of people in here you look around and there's probably two men sitting at a table and then another half elf sitting on another one um, having a meal and uh, some ale at the bar there is a human in about middle-aged um, 
wearing some uh, pretty nice robes. Uh, he's got long, black, greasy hair, and he's basically uh, sitting reading a book at the bar, and uh, Nifron's going to approach him. At first, the um, innkeeper doesn't look up, and then uh, Nifron clears his throat, <clears throat> and uh, the man looks up. Can I help you? Nifron's going to say, I need some rooms for the night, Marcus. Do I know you, friend? How do you know my name? Well, you just look like a Marcus. Lucky guess. Yeah, lucky guess, I guess. They uh, exchange some coin, and uh, Nifron is uh, going to turn to look at you and says, uh, I have four rooms for us. We won't be disturbed. Marcus doesn't recognize me in the shell, but he's a stand-up guy and discreet. And the rooms are clean. Oh, that was easy. It's going up. All right, so Nifron's going to give, uh, take the keys and just uh, take three of the keys and lay them out and take one of the keys he has and goes upstairs. Let's see, one room for Nifron, one room for Juliet and Talia, and one room for each for me and Alexander. Okay. Easy peasy. Sounds good to me. One best grabs a key and heads upstairs. Okay. Hey, Kevin. Yes. Why not? I just realized. Uh, what's that? So, you know that whole, like, get anything that you wanted thing that we had? Uh, yes. I could have asked for the... for that dagger to be destroyed permanently. Uh, maybe. Maybe. Well, okay, so... But you didn't. Sure didn't. I got boots. All right. Um, so after about uh, 30 minutes, or, uh, I guess everybody's going to the room and settling in. Yep. Yep. And then we're yep. going to have to get together and decide how we're going to do this boat thing. After about uh, 30 minutes of you guys settling in, Nifron's going to go and knock on all your doors and uh, ask you to meet him in your, his room. Refresh those spells, everyone, if you're doing that. Uh, I, I would say at this point, uh, you would be able to get a short rest in. I don't think that helps any of us for spells. <laughs> nope. I think that may help John and Shane to get back. It gets me my cheap ones, yeah. And then I think... Uh, Sh- I can get one spell slot back, but... I think I just get my Bardic Inspiration back. But yeah. I, don't th- I think that's later. Yeah, spells, if there was a warlock, then it would be a different story, but as far as I know, everybody recovers spells on long rests. Yep. Nifron's going to uh, ask you all to meet, meet him in his room for planning. Hop on over. We head on over. So, Moving you go on. to Nifron's room, and it's much nicer than the rest of yours, so apparently he's been to this place before, and he knew which one to go to. Um, but there's a, enough room in here. It's kind of uh, not exactly a suite, but there's uh, enough room for everybody to sit comfortably, either on uh, a chair or a bench or on the bed. And he's going to say, um, we have a lot to do before we leave here. We're going to need provisions because once we get to the other side of the river, we're going to be traveling a while over land. So this isn't going to be a quick get over there, get on the boat, and walk all the way there. We, we're going to have to do stuff in the city. Unless you have food for the horses already. Not anymore. They will have gone through much of that while we were in the mountain. I would think. So Nifron's going to say, we're near the market district here. You can go and procure some oats and some grain for the horses. We'll also probably need some extra water skins and if you're going to do any shopping, this is probably the last place to do it for a while. Just so we're clear, we only have a couple of hours we can actually be outside in the city in our disguises. That severely limits what we are able to do. He's going to say, well, the market's just across the street. I'll get food for us and for the horses. Perhaps, uh, Talia, you want to uh, scout the docks, look for boats? I can do that. Do you have any shopping to do, Julia? I know that's something you often like to do. <laughs> uh, I do have a couple of items I wish to sell. And what about you, Alexander? Um, I think I'll just wander around, see if there's anything that 
glimpse my eyes. Uh, who's getting the grain and stuff for the horses? That's me. Illuminous. Okay. What are you doing, Tali? I'm going to check out the docks and see if there's a boat that we can procure in one way or another. Easy enough. Uh, Nifron, uh, how long, approximately, do you think this uh, trip will take for us to walk up the Fadale? Hmm, depends on where we get off on the river. And uh, let me pull up a map. It also depends on how far someone's willing to take us. If they're just ferrying goods to and from the river, it might take us longer to walk. So currently you guys are in Ash Marsh, which is right here. Um, um, uh, if you've made the map available on Roll20, I'm not seeing it. Oh, I'm sorry. For some reason it wasn't. There we go. Let me... So you guys are currently in Ash Marsh, which is right here. So basically you have about, I guess, <laughs> about a, a fifth of a continent that you would have to cross if uh, you're just getting a boat to take you across the river, including these mountains right here. If you were able to find a boat that was headed to either, say, Forest Bay or uh, Faybarrow, that would probably be your best bet. That way you would be on this river for a couple days instead of having to cross uh, across here which would probably take you maybe 10 days to a week, depending on uh, if you could find a uh, path through the mountains. Yeah, I think uh, traveling by river really is our best bet. Yeah. Does it's like very anyone rough terrain. know how Sorry. to navigate through a river? Any of you have any sailing experience? Nope. Could I roll a... Uh, my guys... Alexander's been traveling for a bit. Uh, can I roll a check to see if I have any like basic knowledge on sailing? Give me a intelligence check. Okay. 14. Um, you have been on some boats, and you've seen how it's done, but as far as being able to put together all the components about navigation and sails and rowing and currents... Uh, you probably wouldn't be able to put all that together. A Netflix documentary on sailing does not a sailor make. Okay. I let him know that I have like a basic gist of how it happens, but I'm not very into of like how it all happens together. Yeah, traveling up the river would require hiring a boat. Traveling across the river, you might be able to do that on our own. Or are we going down river to get to Fay Barrel? Or whatever. Do we know the current of this river? Because it, I, I don't know which way it flows from the map. Give me... Well, I mean, you'd have to go out there and look at the river. Or you could give me a history check. 20. Uh, 20. So you would know that uh, you would be fighting the current going up. Okay, I will, I will let everyone know that somehow I know that we will be fighting the current going up paid attention when we crossed at uh, uh, Asheville. Yep, that's exactly what happened. <laughs> so basically, these large rivers right here are being fed from streams and tip tributaries coming down from these mountains and from these huge um, icy mountains to the north. Um, so the water's flowing down this way, and water flows down uh, this way once you get to here. Uh, water starts flowing south. Okay. So Forest Bay is where the river splits, heads east and west. Uh, yes. Okay. Uh, give me a, uh, you're from this area, give me a history check. Alinados. Four. <laughs> um, you vaguely remember something about, uh, the dangerous waters in this area, but you can't remember what the specifics are or what it's called. Um, but you know, there's tells about many boats being lost um, by people who don't know what they're doing as a uh, cautionary tale. Uh, yeah, I know there's some danger there, but I left Silverleaf went straight south to Kala and go along this river. I don't know shit. <laughs> So we shouldn't try to navigate it ourselves, is what I'm hearing. 
Yeah, I don't think any of us are rich white men. We don't do that sort of thing. Well, this is rather convenient. It means we don't have to steal or kill anyone, right? Well, unless we can't hire a boat to take us up river. Or across the river. Which we might be able to do. We'll see. So, Alexander, um, you should uh, check out the crowd situation, see what was going on, while the rest of us do our shopping and scouting. Yeah, I can go and scout around out there and see what's going on. Cool, cool, cool. Oh, uh, don't forget to leave the bag with us so we can buy and sell at our leisure. Uh, sure. I go and give the bag to Julia. Uh, Julia? Uh, yes? Would you pick up um, a couple of belt sheets for, for for me? Sure. How many did you want? Uh, I think three should suffice, but if you can find five that match, I'd super appreciate it. <laughs> Woman of style, you're growing into your own. I do my best. Nifron is going to uh, Alexander and says, I would accompany you. I'd like to see what all the hubbub's about in the center of town as well. You're more than welcome to join. And uh, Nifron's also going to say, your disguises will be probably fading soon, so I would probably do something about that before leaving the inn. I would like to refresh. Refresh? Well, so long as we're traveling separately, Juliet's probably the only one who really would stand out. That is true. Nifron did say that before. All right, so who wants to go first? Who's doing what first? Let's get Alunadas out of the way. He's not doing much. He's just buying grains and uh, dried fruits for everyone. Okay, so you're going to go. Uh, you are currently here. You just have to walk across the street over here where the uh, there's farriers and stables and uh, basically like a wholesale market where you'll be able to find a grain vendor. It'll have okay, like Real grain. quick, what's the name of our inn? Uh, the Laughing Maid. The Laughing Maid. All right. So I head across the street and look for some wholesalers so I can get a couple of bags of oats for the horses and uh, dried uh, uh, dried apples and bananas for the rest of us. They do have apples, but they don't have bananas. Uh, God damn it. You'll be able to also find maybe some like dried figs. Okay, figs will work. And um, how many days worth are you getting? I'll go ahead and get two weeks worth and you know, just... Prepare for the worst, hope for the best sort of thing. Okay. So with all that grain and the dried fruit, it is going to come to a grand total of 15 gold pieces. All right. I'm not even going to try to haggle because I don't know that that's a thing. <laughs> so uh, you take that back uh, to probably the stables and load up your cart. Uh, you I'm going to ask them to deliver it because that's probably a little bit too much for me to carry with my tin strength. Okay, they'll say they, uh, they'll deliver it for uh, an extra five silver. Cool, cool, cool. All right. Uh, anything else you want to do? Um, I'm going to see if they have a bit of... No, wait, we have infinite rope. No need to buy toys for Abbott. We'll <laughs> make some chew, chew toys out of rope for Abbott. Yep. Uh, Tell you take an Abbott with you? Um. He needs to learn no. to heal and deal with crowds, right? Yeah, but I'm not sure this is the best time to do that. Okay. Also, since uh, Abbott's not a service animal, he's going to have to stay out in the stables. Aw, puppy. That's okay. He can keep his still company. <laughs> As you walk away. You haven't been spending a lot of time together. Uh, tonight, uh, when we when we get back, I plan on going out to the stables and doing some training with him. Okay. And play. It's, it's not all work. All right, so, uh, John, you done? Yep. Okay, let's do uh, Talia. All right, so I'm going to go down to the stable, or not to the stables. <laughs> I'm going to go down to the docks and see if I can find anyone. Just kind of ask around and see if anybody's headed towards... Bay Barrel? Uh, there's, yeah. uh, there's Forest Bay and Bay Barrel would probably be the two largest cities on that peninsula. So yeah, I'll ask and see if anybody's headed in that direction. Okay, so you make it down to the docks, and there's really not a, a lot of people uh, down in the docks area this day. Uh, most of the people that you've seen uh, have been walking um, towards the center of town. But you make it out to the docks. Here there's probably about 20 docks or so, 
Um, there's some smaller ships that you think you probably don't need to bother with because they can't handle what you would need to take across the river, which is going to narrow it down to about uh, two ships, maybe a third that might work, um, but they would have to, they wouldn't be able to carry like any sort of uh, other cargo. And these ships aren't like uh, mass ships, they are uh, riverboats um, that are flat, um, that look like uh, they're ore powered uh, to be able to get up the current. Okay. I will approach, uh, we'll start with the largest one and um, and uh, just see uh, where they're headed if they, if they could take on a cargo and how far they could take it. So you uh, approach the largest one and there's two humans um, that are just hanging out on barrels, um, playing cards, uh, outside the ship. They, uh, see you approach, and they're basically just, they, like, see you, and then go back to what they're doing, basically ignoring you. Um, I'll say, uh, I- excuse me, I-, I just, uh, could I get a moment of your time? Ah, what you want, little gal? She's disguised as a boy. Yeah, I'm, I'm disguised little, as a little boy. <laughs> what you want, little boy? Uh, well, I was just wondering, my, my family and I are, are trying to, um, get up river a ways, and I was wondering if you could take us on as, uh, as cargo. I don't make those decisions, that'd be the captain, but he's not here right now. Do you know when he'll be back? Uh, probably sometime tonight, I know he's out drinking at one of the inns. By any chance do you happen to know which inn? Uh, probably the closest one, he was pretty thirsty. Well, thank you so much. I will either check back later or uh, pro- maybe tomorrow. So it's yourself. Um, I'll go ahead and walk to the next largest. Okay, so you walk to the next largest. There's uh, three men standing outside on the dock just talking. Uh, I- excuse me, uh, gentlemen. Can I ask you a quick question? Yeah. My, my family and I are trying to get up to the... Um, uh, up river a ways, and I was wondering if you would uh, know if you could take us. I was setting out tomorrow morning, but we're not going up a river. We're going across it. Okay, we we might. Would you have space for? I'm gonna pretend like I remember how many people. How many people? Five. Five people. Six horses and a cart and a dog. The older gentleman uh, in this group says. We gotta take on some cargo, but I think we could probably handle that. Uh, how much would it be to get across the river? Hmm, and he does some mental calculations in his head. Will you be bringing anything else across other than the cards? Do you have any supplies or cargo? Uh, there, I mean, there will be supplies for, for the horses and, and the doggo and us, but, um, I'm, let me say that again and not say doggo, I'm sorry. <laughs> There will be supplies for the horses and for us and for the dog, but most of that should fit on the cart itself. He d- does some math in his head and uh, says, yeah, we could do that. It'd be 50 gold. 50 gold? Okay. Um, let me let me talk to my fam- family about that and I'll get back to you within the hour. Okay. Well, it's half now and then half when we get across the river. Seems reasonable. Um, Don't I wait will... too long or we'll be taking on other cargo. Okay, I, I just have to talk to them real quick. I'll be right back. And I'm going to try to find somebody. Well, no, because I have to make this decision, don't I? Because I'm not going to be able to find Juliet or Lunadas or uh, Alexander and Nifron. No, no you might be able to find Luno at the uh, end, but you wouldn't have yeah, that, I don't know. No pressure. I'll... I'll you know what? Let's do it. We'll go ahead and book this boat to take us across the river. I'll, I'll, I'll go ahead and say, you know what? Just, I'm just gonna go ahead and and book it. I'll go ahead and pay you 25 now, and then 25 when we get across. And uh, he says, "Deal," and he's going to uh, pull out his hand for the coin. I'll pull out my coin purse and count out 25 gold and hand it to him. He drops it into his cold purse, and then he's going to spit in his hand and hold it out for to, to you to shake. I'll look at it for a second, spit in my own, and shake his hand. And uh, he says, done deal. We'll leave it first light tomorrow. 
All right, we will be here early, uh, bright and early to, to load up. He says, don't take too long. If you wait till afternoon, I'll take another cargo and leave you. That won't be a problem, but thank you, sir. And the deposit, it's non-refundable. Also reasonable. You're expected to hold space for us, I understand. All right, I'll see you tomorrow morning. See you in the morning, sir. And I'll I'll walk off to the, the inn. Okay. Do uh, you want to do anything else? Uh, oh, actually, now would be a great time to go to the stables and train, work work on some training with the, uh, with, uh, Abbott. Uh, okay, so what are you trying to train him to do? Um, what, have we d- established what he does know from travels with us? Stay. Okay, I'll try to, uh, I'll work on... on... <laughs> I'll try to work on, uh stay more firmly and maybe sit and down and heal. Uh, you would probably, if you're going to spend like a couple hours to, to do this, you might be able to teach him like two commands, but not all of that. Okay, then I will just try, since he basically knows sit, I will just, or not sit, stay. I, I'll try sit. Okay, give me a animal handling check. Eleven. So he's not really, he, it seems like he's backslid a little bit, um, just where you haven't been spending a, a lot of time with him recently. Um, but he's kind of getting it, but like not. You tell him to like stay, and then he's up and down, and then tries to run over to you, but you not think he's getting it. Okay, um, I'll just play with him for half an hour and then go up to my room. Okay. So, uh, you go back into the inn, and, um, it being a little later now, probably about three hours later, um, you're starting to see, um, some people come into the inn, and, uh, they all seem to be, like, chatty, chatting about something. Um, I'm gonna tuck my coin of eavesdropping under, I don't know, somewhere where it's not gonna be found easily, and then... I'm gonna I'm gonna head to the room so I can eavesdrop on what's happening without having to be in the crowd. Uh, okay. So where where are you putting the coin? Um. Okay. So I'm gonna draw some stuff and then I'll erase it. I promise. All right. So if this is the the common room and there's like, I will tuck it under. Mm, like, where would the bar be? Like in this crappy <laughs> picture of. <laughs> Um, Where would the bar be? It would be up against this uh, eastern wall. Okay, so it would be it would be here. I will drop it um, right in like. Oh wait, where are the stairs? That's the other thing I need to know. Uh, the stairs would be over here towards the north. <sighs> Talia needs to start chewing your gum so she can stick the coin places. Can I? Right? Can I? Can I do a? a, a perception or investigation, I'm not sure which one it would be, um, to see if I can see a place that um, where I could I could uh, hide it without like in a corner or, or in like a crack of, on the floor or in like a crack of a wall or something like that. Um, give me a give me an investigation check. Aw, oh, sick. Do you think probably any place as good as any place else? Okay, I will... Is there a handrail on the stairs? Uh, there is. I'm going to uh, try to shove it in the in the crack between the wall and like the end of the handrail. Okay. And then I'll go up to my room, and I will now try to figure out how to erase uh, what I just... Oh, perfect. All right. So uh, you head up to your room. I'm going to just uh, like hang out on my bed and eavesdrop with the coin, however that works. You sit on the bed for a while, and you haven't used this coin before. Uh, give me a intelligence check. 23. All right, so um, you put the coin there, and you realize that um, once you get backed up to the room, that uh, you don't know how to activate it, and the key to probably activating it is somewhere on the coin. Well, shit. I guess I'll, I'll head back down and try to get retrieve the coin and grab myself some food okay so uh you walk uh, downstairs 
and give me a, uh, at this time, there's more people in the common room. There's probably about uh, 15 or people or so. Um, it looks like there's now some uh, some servers in the room that are waiting on tables. And uh, the guy that Nifron called uh, Marcus is still tending bar. Um, you notice uh, a few people see you walk down the steps and kind of turn their head as you walk down. Are you a, uh, do you still have the disguise up at this point? Yeah, I'll have reapplied it before I went back downstairs. Okay, um, give me a slide ahead and check. 25. Okay, so as you, uh, walk down these steps, uh, you put your hand on the rail and definitely, uh, take your fingers and remove the coin from where you wedged it, uh, with no one, none the wiser that you can tell. Awesome. I will... Uh, try to find a table to sit at. Um, there's about 10 or 15 people in here, and um, there is a table near one of the windows that seats two people that's currently empty. I will take that one. Okay, so um, you sit down at the table. Probably 10 minutes go by for a woman who appears to be a server in the stab- establishment uh, walks up to you and says, What can I get you, Dieter? I'll take, uh, whatever the special is today. Lime and potatoes, is that all right? That sounds amazing, actually. All right, do you need anything to drink? Um, do you have any, like, just like some juice or water? Uh, we have water and milk. I'll have some milk with it. All right. And she's going to turn and go to the kitchen. You should have made her flirt. Just to screw it. Oh, God. (laughs) I mean, she's she's not... She's not with talking to a priest or anything. I'm she glad that uh, boy. you're disguised as a young boy because disguise self does not change your voice. Just so people know. <laughs> yeah, that's that's why I <laughs> said specifically a teenage boy. Or I, Mike Tyson. <laughs> or my, I could I could just make myself look like Mike Tyson, and then no one would believe I was real. So at this point in the evening, uh, you haven't eaten anything since breakfast, and your stomach's starting to rumble. And uh, you see her come out, and she has a, uh, a plate of lamb and potatoes, and she's approaching your table, and then she veers off to sit it in front of somebody else. Aww. One of those. <laughs> um, but after uh, about 15 minutes, uh, she comes out and sits a plate down in front of you with some milk. Thank you so much. How much do I have? Uh, I could pl- just place it on your room tab, or if you want to pay now, that'll be three gold pieces. I'll uh, pass her five gold pieces and say thank you so much. Oh, thank you very much, chap. And she's uh, going to walk away. Awesome. I'll start eating and eavesdropping at the same time. Okay. I can do that, I swear. Eavesdropping. Uh, give me a perception check. Nine. Um, so, with the blend of voices in this room... They're not extremely loud, but the nearest table that's occupied to you is probably about 10 feet away, and you're picking up bits and pieces of the conversation and them laughing, but you don't know exactly. You're not really putting it together what they're saying because of all the background noise. Uh, Can I try to listen harder, like try to focus on that table? You could probably try to move around the room or try to get closer. And then I would allow you to do another perception check. Gotcha. I'll just I'll just eat my meal for now and see if anybody from my party shows up. Gotcha. Because I can't just let you like, oh, well, I fell that one. Like, I want to do another one. <laughs> yeah, no, I totally. I, I was thinking more like I, I I could like tilt my head more in their direction and see if I can pick up more. But like, I totally understand. All right. Do you want to stud while you're sitting there study that coin at all? Yes. Yes, I do. Okay, give me a uh, investigation check. Eighteen. All right, so you start uh, reading around this uh, thing. There's one word that sticks out uh, in some of the. Uh, there's writing on this coin, but it's like in the circle in this phrase that doesn't really kind of make sense. But the one word that sticks out to you that's kind of like engraved larger than the rest of it uh, says mischief. Okay, I will try just whispering mischief in the direction of the coin. I'm not quite sure. 
you whisper mischief into the coin and then instantly like things get louder in your head like uh have you ever been in a room uh talking on the phone and the person you're talking in the phone uh two walks into the room and then you hear them in stereo yes it's kind of like that but in your head well that's exciting uh when i finished my meal um unless somebody walked in that from the party i'll go ahead and um head back upstairs okay at uh, this point, you would have seen a uh, uh, Lunados uh, come in towards the end of your mill. Okay, I'll uh, I'll kind of follow him up the stairs, I guess. Okay. Uh, is there anything else you want to do? Nope, that's it. Okay, so we're going to go back uh, in time about two hours earlier, since all this is kind of happening at the same time, uh, to Juliet. So, Juliet, what are you doing? All right, so I have actually have a shopping list here. Damn. Juliet has to sell some of the spare items that are left around. Uh, they're generic items. There's chain mail, war pick, shield, longbow, that sort of stuff. Um, and she needs to sell them off quick, so she's more than willing to let them go for half price. That was what I was calculating while you were doing that part with uh, Talia. Okay. But then Juliet has to buy a lot of stuff. Uh, all like magic components and such as well as the five straps uh, that Talia requested okay so you are going to need to go into uh, the merchant district uh, which would be down here where I'm pinging Mm -hmm. Um, so you can either ask around or give me an investigation check to find the, the shops that you're looking for You'll be able to find this. It's just how long is it going to take you to do it? <laughs> hey, I guess it's going to take me a long time. Natural one. So uh, you wander around for about 15 minutes and you're not really finding anything. So you think you can either like wander around some more or ask some money? I, I think asking someone's probably prudent. Juliet will find the nearest person who looks moderately uh, merchant-y. Not someone who's dirt poor, not someone who's super rich. Somewhere in the middle there. Okay. Um, excuse me, um, I am looking for uh, a shop of some kind for generic goods. Would you know where I would be able to find that? I'm sorry to trouble you. Generic goods, like a general store, says uh, this. Yes, uh, yes. Uh, you're talking to a like a younger human in his teens that's uh, pretty finely dressed. So uh, he's going to say uh, there's quite a few general stores in this area. Um, the closest one is probably just three shops down if you uh, take this alley. Oh, excellent. Thank you. Um, if I might impose as well, is there some sort of shop for magical uh, things? A friend of mine needs some inks. Uh, yeah, there's uh, one right on the, uh, the main street here across from the uh, garrison. Oh, excellent. Which Thank would be so in this uh, area right here. So from what he's told you, um, the general store that you're looking for is right here. And then the uh, magical components place would be over here across from the garrison. All right, Juliet, we'll head to the general, general store place then first. Okay, so uh, you walk up to this place and you can't miss it. It appears to be a franchise, Mad Cedric's Discount Goods and Adventures Emporium, but it's smaller. Nice. It's not uh, not like the big box uh, Mad Cedric stores that you've uh, been to before. You think you probably just expanded <laughs> here recently. Great. Juliet will walk in and uh, see what's there. You walk in and it's basically the equivalent of a mix mash of a Dollar General and Bass Pro Shops. <laughs> Fantasy, of course. And uh, a little gnome's going to see you uh, walk in and there's really nobody in the store at this point, so... Uh, you've got all his attention. He's like, yes, yes, what can I help you with? Oh, um, I have several goods I want to sell. And I was also wondering if you would happen to have, um, straps. Something that is adjustable, around, would fit around a halfling, or, uh, say construction work, or such. Uh, what kind? Leather? Cloth? Metal? Leather, please. I think we may have something like that in our tax section. And uh, he's going to motion for you to follow, and he takes you over to a corner of the store, and there are 
there's like uh, two saddles and there are some uh, harnesses um, for horses. And he says, uh, would something like this work? Um, I suppose so. We also have leather belts. Maybe, maybe leather belts are more in the uh, area. Okay. And uh, he's going to stop off into another section. And uh, you enter a section and there's uh, uh, multiple belts of different sizes here. Uh, the longest one they probably got is uh, about 70 inches long and it's made out of uh, a thick leather. And uh, he says, uh, this is about the biggest one we've got. You can always cut it down to size. Uh, we only have uh, two of them now. They're, for, they're meant for putting across your chest to hold like a sword on your back, like a great sword. Do you have anything that would be uh, lighter? Uh, yes, we've got regular clothing belts here. And he shows you some that some are just leather strips and other ones are like um, like leather tongs that have uh, uh, been braided together. You know what? I'll take the two larger ones. All right. And he uh, takes them off the shelf and puts them over his shoulder. Is there anything else I can help you with? Oh, um, yes. I'm looking for a chest. Something that's um, about yay big, and she motions to something that's uh, about three feet by two feet by two feet. Says we may have something like that. And uh, he's going to take you into another corner of the store, and um, there's three chests there. Uh, the largest one uh, appears to be about two and a half feet uh, by two feet. Uh, by two feet, and then the other ones are much smaller, like a foot by a foot, and the other one is probably like a foot and a half by a foot. The larger one will work perfectly. All right. Uh, do you mind carrying it up front? Oh, of course. And um, I was wondering if you buy used items. Jen? Mm, it depends on what they are. Uh, mostly weaponry. We'll bring him up front and we'll look at him. Okay then. And Juliet brings the chest to the front as well as uh, several pieces of armor and equipment. Um, so he is going to uh, walk over um, towards the front middle of the store and there's like this uh, this case that's got like a, a wood table that goes in a square all the way around it and then there's glass underneath it and you see like vials for potions and powders and various other um, more expensive items that they have, you know, locked behind, um, like the razor case at the CVS. Um, and then he's going to climb up on a stool and um, sit down and says, uh, let's see what you got. Oh, okay. Um, here, I have this fine suit of chain mail. And uh, you put it down and uh, he starts looking over it and says, uh, has this seen any battle? Oh, yes, but it's been magically repaired and upkept up. Hmm. And uh, he starts uh, looking at it and he says, uh, See, just a little bit of rust on this and some denting, but nothing too bad. Hmm. How much are you wanting for it? I was hoping uh, around 35 gold. 32 and it's a deal. Done. Okay. Uh, next, I have this war pick. Um, it's admittedly very used. Uh, i give you a three gold for it. Sure, I can take that. Okay, anything else? I have the shield, again, uh, used violently. Um, Susan's so going to take it and uh, knock on it. He's like, uh, yeah, we, we don't sell many of these, um, but I'll give you, a, mm, let's say, five gold for it. Oh, absolutely. All right. And I have maybe a pair here. A longbow and some arrows. Uh, 20 arrows. Completely unused. Hmm, he takes it and says, Well, we've always got call for these around here. How much do you want for it? I was hoping 20 gold. Uh, that's a little little expensive, I, I think. I could probably give you 15 for it. 15 sounds great. Alright, uh, is there anything else? Um, no, I think that's it. So, do you want to put that money against what you're buying today? Uh, yes, absolutely. 
So with the, the two leather straps and the chest, and what else are you buying? Uh, the leather straps, the chest, and that's it. Okay. So, uh, he says, let's see, and he's doing the math in his head. Between the chest and the leather straps, uh, I'll say I'll give you ten gold versus what we traded. Sure, that sounds fair enough to me. Alright, so he's going to, uh, count out ten gold, uh, out of a purse on his side and stack it up in front of you and says, uh, is there anything else I can help you with today? Could I interest you in some potions or powders or some of our higher-end magical items? Magical items, you say? Um, tell me more. I'm curious. Oh, uh, we, we've got some of your more basic stuff, like, you know, rings of protection. We've got healing potions. Some of the higher-end potions we have is a potion of flight, we have a potion of strength, a potion of diminution. The potion of flight and the potions of healing, how much are those each? Just a moment, and he's going to pull out a ledger and start looking at it. So, the potion of flying, this one here in particular is... That'll be 700 gold pieces. Oh, um, that's quite expensive. How much for the healing potions? Uh, the healing potions, those are, well, we have two lessers here and a greater. The lesser potions are, and he goes thumbing through that, potion of uh, lesser healing that is 100 gold pieces, and the potion of greater, that one is 250. So, I'm interested in buying all of the healing potions you have. That would be a total of what... Uh, that would be, uh, let's see, 250 plus, uh, the 150 for the two others, so it'd be 300, uh, four, uh, 500, or 450 gold pieces. All right, perfect, yeah. Uh, I'm interested in all of those healing potions. 450? Uh, since you're buying all three, I could let it, you want to do a, uh, uh, persuasion check? Sure. An eight. <laughs> so, uh, he's going to say, uh, for all three, I could probably let those go for, let's say, 430 gold pieces. Sure, I could do that. All right. How much gold do you have on you right now? We have the bag of holding worth of gold. <laughs> 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 all right. Uh, so he'll give you the three potions, and uh, you give him uh, 430 gold. Perfect. Um, that will be all. Thank you so much for your help. I really appreciate it. Uh, thank you, and, and come again. By the way, uh, you've got the, the two uh, lesser ones are Arctic Chill, and uh, the greater one is uh, Berry Blast flavored. <laughs> so he says, uh, thank you, and come again to Matt Cedric's Discount Goods and Adventures of Porian. Tell your friends. I will. And uh, Juliet's going to leave. All right. Uh, is there anything else you want to do? Sorry, just recalculating the gold values and the items. Um, how how far out of the way is where Juliet is? Is there like an isolated alley she can duck, duck down and recast her illusion spell? Um, you are currently over here at the general store area. Um, you could probably walk out here. Um, these are pretty densely packed. Um, you're not seeing a lot of foot traffic through here, so you may be able to do it, or you could walk um, maybe about a quarter mile out here into the woods and do it. Or not out into the woods, but like this the this marshy area. Uh, Juliet's going to go to the path less traveled, but not all the way out of the city, just the low foot traffic area and recast that. Okay, give me a perception check. Sure. Three. Uh, you don't currently see anybody around. Perfect. Uh, are you going to try to, like, stealth? Uh, yes. Okay, roll me a stealth check. Say seven. Uh, you go behind a building and you're up against it. And you've got kind of a crate covering a little bit. You, you think uh, you are very well hidden. Of course, I can't see them. They can't see me. Hold this trick in the book. 
Uh, so you're recasting the sky self? Uh, yes. Okay. Uh, so what are you doing now? Then Julia is going to make her way over to the magic store that he, she was told about. Okay, so uh, you make it out onto the uh, this main road here. You see the garrison up on your left, and you look directly to your right. There is a uh, magical component shop, and uh, this appears to be a franchise of the wizard's wardrobe. <laughs> Excellent. Juliet will walk in with confidence, knowing that uh, maybe she'll find someone who actually understands magic. So you walk in. While not a large shop, uh, it's kind of densely packed inside. There are racks with like cloaks and robes and uh, belts and sashes crowding all the walls. Uh, you have to walk through aisles of like these circular racks, like uh, Kmart racks um, that have uh, robes and cloaks on them. Towards the back of the store, um, there is an elf behind a uh, glass counter looks up and sees you and says welcome welcome what can i help you with oh uh hello i'm looking to purchase a number of magical uh reagents yes we have many what are you looking for um i have a list here and uh juliet reveals a list for 25 piece gold pieces of gold dust 10 gold pieces of charcoal incense and herbs 50 gold piece diamond 10 gold piece lead based ink and 700 gold pieces of magic inks. So you hand that to the intendant, and um, he's going to say, this is quite an order, but I believe we have everything that you're looking for. And uh, he puts down the list, reaches behind the counter, and starts pulling out some jars and some empty vials as he measures out uh, various components like the, the gold dust and the charcoal and the inks, and then goes over to the, uh, another shelf and pulls out... Um, like an inkwell uh, and empty vials and starts filling those up. And after about 15 minutes of this measuring and putting all this stuff together, he pulls out this uh, very finely crafted uh, like uh, dark wood box and starts putting all this stuff inside, turns it around with the lid open and shows it to you and says, uh, I believe everything is in order here. Does it meet your satisfaction? Who, like, gives it a once-over and nods. Yes, this is perfect. All right, and what was the total on that? That is going to be... I forgot to calculate. I think that's 795 gold pieces. Okay, give me a uh, pers um, persuasion check. Say five. Why would I ever roll above ten today? Uh, so, um, Elf behind the counter is going to say... That'll be 810 gold pieces. Oh, uh, yes, of course. Wait, does that add up? Oh, taxes, right. 810, you said? Yes. Juliet counts out 810 gold pieces. And is there anything else that I can help you with? Um, no, I believe that's it. Thank you. Have a wonderful afternoon. You as well. And Juliet uh, goes back, heads back uh, to the... In if there's nothing else. Uh, okay, you head back to the inn. And around this time, uh, you are seeing uh, uh, Lunados and uh, Talia walking upstairs. Juliet hurriedly uh, catches up with the pair. Okay. Um, so now that leaves Alexander and Nifron. That is I. You leave the inn and you begin to walk up the center of the street. And yet again, this is probably two hours or earlier since all this happened at the same time. And um, you start following the crowds towards the, uh, the center of the city, up here by the, uh, the manor house, which is the only walled pl uh, place really uh, in here. So as you approach, um, you're going to see to your south, there appears to be a seven-story um, stone tower in front of you is this large manor house that has these large stone walls that are about 12 feet tall. There's a large uh, portcullis in front of it uh, with iron bars that are currently up right now. Um, through there you can see that there are um, a couple of small houses uh, and a stable as well as about a four-story stone keep inside of it. 
but it looks like everybody's coming up here towards the center of town and turning north towards one of these large temples. So, uh, Nifron is going to, uh, turn north and follow this crowd. Are you going with him? Yep. So as you, uh, turn north, you are going to start running into a crowd as they, um, all start, um, moving towards, uh, this temple. Give me a religion check. Yep. You love it. Um, you don't quite recognize the, the design of this, though it looks kind of familiar. But as you look towards the top of this tower, uh, you're going to see the holy symbol of Palor on it. As the, the crowds uh, get towards the uh, towards this temple, uh, give me a perception check. Uh, crit fail. <laughs> it appears that they're all facing the temple and looking at something. You can see the uh, people out front um, like yelling something. As you listen closer, uh, you can hear uh, kill them. You're going to see Nifron start, like, making his way um, off to the uh, left of the temple through, like, this alleyway that goes between some of these larger manor houses here and over here towards the left of the temple. Uh, looks like he's trying to get a uh, better viewpoint. I'll do the same, but on the right side. Is that possible? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, so you are moving up in, uh, to the, the right side, which is kind of up the street. And we'll say that uh, you hook around and come around from behind uh, to get closer to see what's going on. Give me a, uh, another perception check. Fifteen. Okay, so from you've gotten closer and you're getting a, a better vantage point. And what you can see at this point is there appears to be some gallows erected out in front of this temple. It looks like there are uh, three men and two women that are currently being uh, strung up after a few minutes um, you're going to uh, hear someone shouting from in front of this temple give me another perception check to see if you can hear what they're saying uh, fail wait a second I think I might have a uh, I'm, I'm gonna check to see if I can use my bardic inspiration on me yet <laughs> I'm pretty sure I'm not I like to check. can you use bardic inspiration on yourself uh, you have to be a certain level. I'm just checking to see what level that is. Yeah, I don't think I am. No, I don't think I'm able to use Bark Inspiration on myself. Okay, so uh, with a six, you're basically like just hearing a large man yelling out in front of this building. You're not, with all the echoes and the crowd noise, you're not able to, to pick out what he's saying. And then... Uh, you're going to hear him, you know, stop yelling. And then a couple seconds after that, you're going to hear this crowd roar in approval. And then uh, after probably 10 minutes after that, they're going to stop dis uh, and disperse. So, like, uh, appears the show's over. And this was a public execution. <laughs> after about um, 15 minutes, um, this... Uh, crowd is, is thinned out and there's only like a couple of stragglers left and uh, you could probably move forward and see what's uh, going on. Yeah, I'd like to circle back around from where I came on the front side. You circle back around <clears throat> and you're going to look across the square and you're going to see those gallows uh, with the, the people hanging from them and uh, across the uh, square there's like this uh, like sign out in front of this temple that Nifron appears to be reading. But uh, are you inspecting the bodies? Uh, yeah, I'd like to look at them. You approach the bodies in three male and uh, two female. Most of them appear to be human, but there is a half-elf. And on their chest, painted in this red paint, as they dangle um, from the gallows, is the uh, red talon symbol. Eh, that happens. I would like to meet up with Nifron. So you walk across the square, and Nifron is still studying this uh, sign, scoffs at it, and turns and looks at you and says, What do you think about this? It's part of the job. This is uh, what the sign says. If you want to read that out loud. Uh, a reward has been issued from the priesthoods of Arathus and Paylor for any member or associate to the Red Talons of 100 gold. 
100,000 gold offered dead or alive for the leader of the Red Talons called the Harbinger. 3,000 gold offered dead or alive for the Red Talons Black Dragonborn called Sish. 1,000 gold offered dead or alive for each member of the group masquerading as the companions. Members include a large female Red Dragonborn with halberd and heavy armor known as Juliet Starstorm. Human male bard with brown hair of average build named Alexander. Elf with sandy brown hair of slight build. A mule male of stock build with great sword and heavy armor called Edel Belmont, also wanted for patricide and currently young human female approximately 11 years with blonde hair. So he's going to say uh, this could be your fate if you're not careful. And then, I know. And then he says, and then there's this, and he's going to walk over to a uh, another sign that is uh, on the uh, on the opposite side of this church door. Bounty has been placed upon four artifacts of the Savior's reward of ten thousand gold offered upon recovery. Those parties interested should inquire and be sanctioned by the Temple of Palor. Only those sanctioned by the Priesthood of Palor are eligible for the reward. Those unsanctioned and found in possession of any artifact of the Savior shall be severely punished. Nifron's going to point towards the uh, the door of this temple, and you're going to notice that you can see at least like two what appears to be adventuring parties waiting uh, outside the doors of this temple. Nifron's going to say, "I think that's enough excitement for this evening, don't you?" Good enough for me. So uh, he's going to turn and start walking back towards the end. I will follow. We should definitely get that thing. <laughs> Collect on yourself. We're really good at finding these guys. And yet they keep getting away. I don't get it. <laughs> and I think that's probably a pretty good place to end it right there. Thanks for listening to another episode of the Dungeons & Debacles podcast. If I could ask a halfling size favor... Give us a five-star rating and review on iTunes. It's the best way to support us. New episodes come out every Monday, so make sure to check your podcast app. Do you have an idea to make the podcast better? Tell us about it on Twitter or Facebook. You can also check out our website to see all the maps, lore, and characters at DungeonsAndDebaclesPodcast.com. And now a word from our fantasy sponsor. Cedric of Matt Cedric's Discount Goods and Adventures Emporium. Is your cleric a creep? Is your druid a drag? Try our healing potions. They put pep in your step and get you back in the fight. A healing potion will never try to convert you to a god or get into a moral debate with you. Just drink it and feel better about the decisions that led you to your current situation. Try our new flavors exclusive to Matt Cedric's Discount Goods and Adventures Emporium. Berry Blitz, Melon Melee, and Arctic Gel. Side effects may include delusions of grandeur, increased risk of infection, drowsiness, impotence, red ache, and bloody stool. Ask your cleric if healing potions are right for you. My prices are so low, I'm practically giving this stuff away. How do I do it? Don't worry about it. Come on in to Matt Cedric's Discount Goods and Adventures Emporium. We have convenient locations in a city near you. Just talk to the town guard for directions. Matt Cedric's Discount Goods and Adventures Emporium, where the only thing matters than me is the savings. Matt Cedric's got the deals. The music you heard on this episode was Long Road Ahead, Crowd Hammer, Folk Round, Teller of the Tales, River Fire, Arcane, Forest in the Trees, Minstrel Guild, Mystery Bazaar, Zazzy, Wizard Torium, and Death of Kings by Kevin McLeod in Incompetech.com. Licensed under Creative Commons by Attribution 3.0 License. CreativeCommons.org slash licenses slash buy slash 3.0.